Welcome to The Dish on Divorce. I'm Leanne Townsend. And I'm Jennifer Barkin. And in today's episode, I'm really excited about our guest. His name is Reno Belzano. And Reno is a very talented guy. He um, is here today because he has expertise as a mortgage broker. And we're going to be talking about mortgages in the context of divorce. But he also owns a business that is very near and dear to my heart, which is Taz Hair Salon, because uh, I am a client there, a longtime client. And uh, so my hair, which is, it's not, I, I shouldn't be advertising my hair right now because of COVID. It's not getting its it, it, usual, than usual care, but uh, I, uh, his salon is fantastic, so uh, shout out to Taz Salon as well. But welcome to the show, Rena. Thank you for having me. You should me. say where it's located. It's located on in Blur West, or on Blur Street, actually in the Kingsway area. Um, and uh, it's a great salon. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, um, why don't you start by telling listeners a little bit about um, your business, um, and not it's not the hair business, but all the listeners might want to hear about that as well. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, your more your mortgage business. Yeah. So what I do is I provide people with uh, mortgage solutions, uh, whether they're purchasing a home, uh, refinancing, or um, buying commercial real estate or land. And do you work with a lot of people who are, you know, going through a divorce or have are recently divorced? Yes, yes. Um, more than ever lately, uh, due to the circumstances of COVID, there seems to be an influx, and you probably know this yourself, an influx in divorces. So, um, you know, just helping people, uh, providing them with ideas in, in uh, situations where they can help either to buy out a spouse or if they're buying another home. Um, giving them solutions on doing that. What sort of challenges um, do people who are separating when they're trying to get financing, are there any specific challenges specific to them? Um, you know, I, I'll tell you, there's two big ones that always tend to come up. Um, one of them being the um, notarizing of, of the separation agreement. And uh, that needs to be notarized in order to provide that information for a lender. Um, sometimes it's, you know, one of the two parties doesn't want to sign or if they sign, there needs, it needs to be in, you know, the presence of a lawyer or, or certified or stamped by a judge. Um, sometimes those things are, people tend to prolong that process. And then they, um, that kind of prolongs the process of the financing part as well, because that's kind of the final, you know, dot on, uh, on getting the financing. The second one is, um, is probably, uh, what happens is some people, we can qualify them based on their um, spousal support or child support. And um, what happens is sometimes people are, you know, the person providing them the spousal support isn't paying them or they're just paying them with cash. Um, we, there needs to be a paper trail showing that they're getting the money, uh, bank statements, and um, lenders want to see that, that trend in order to um, provide financing. Much like Revenue Canada, they like to see the child support trail too. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, most people don't know that. It's funny that, uh, sorry, most go ahead. Most people don't know that you can, spousal support and child support are great factors to um, qualify someone for a mortgage. Some uh, people think that, you know, oh my God, you know, wh whether you're, you know, one of the spouses isn't working or hasn't worked in years, um, they feel like, oh my God, I have to get a job so I can get a mortgage. But sometimes just the spousal and child support alone will help you qualify for a mortgage. Yeah, it's interesting because I know even in my situation and I work and, you know, I'm a lawyer and, and whatnot and my child support, you know, I always add that in when I'm renewing my mortgage as part, you know, to show I, in addition to what I'm making in my yes. job, I'm also, you know, getting this and it like it's it's relevant. It's important. Um, one of the things you, you touched on there that I, I find comes up for me a lot with clients is they've um, sold the matrimonial home um, and but we're still we have not finalized the separation agreement they're still fighting about 
everything and there's a lot of issues and the funds from the matrimonial home are being held in trust um, and someone's chomping at the bit to get them released because they all want they want to buy that new you know dream place but we don't have a separation agreement in place and you know maybe you can explain to listeners like that how important you know that that is because you, someone from what I understand like they're not going to get approval for a mortgage if they That's haven't right. got either a court order or a separation agreement absolutely and and, and again going back to it being notarized and and stamped um, what happens is a lender will not because what in the separation agreement it'll detail who's receiving the support who's not if there's anything pending um, and those come into play with the lender, they don't want to lend you, you know, money saying, well, I'm getting the child support. And then all of a sudden that separation agreement, when it's finally finalized, it's you're actually paying this child support, not actually receiving it or the spousal support. So yes, um, those things need to kind of come into play that it's kind of putting the, you know, you got to put the horse in front of the carriage, not the carriage in front of the horse and having that separation agreement before we even try to get any financing has to be completely finalized and notarized. That's another power game that spouses do play. Yeah. Actually, that happened to me many years ago where I had a house that I wanted to buy. It was a very hot market and everything was agreed on, but he knew that I wanted to buy this house. So he just felt that, you know what? I'm not gonna sign that separation agreement. Um, he signed it, but maybe a week later, and it was just a power and control game, but I did lose the house that I had wanted to purchase because I didn't have a signed separation agreement. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Do you see that come up, power games that way, Reno? Yeah, I do. Um, it's unfortunate. Those are things that are kind of out of our control. Again, I can't um, submit to a lender until it's signed, and, uh, and it's always that, you know, I got clients on the phone crying and, and saying, I really want this place. And I'm like, I, I can't promise that we're going to get any financing until it's signed by your spouse uh, agreeing to the agreement. So that does come into play. Uh, it's unfortunate. It's something that it's out of my hands, but um, you know, I'm sure you guys hear a lot of these stories as well. And uh, it's again, just unfortunate. The other thing that I find comes up with my clients is uh, one of the spouses will submit a mortgage application and because they're trying to get financing, they will jack up what their income is. And so then the other side wants disclosure of the mortgage application <laughs> and, you know, then it gets used against them because they're claiming they've got this low income, but then lo and behold, to get financing, they put down that they earn a hundred thousand more than they're claiming they earn. Um, so I don't know what comments you have on that, but it does, I find it does come up a fair bit. Well, the whole thing is, you know, you got to be honest because these things do, uh, they come up. Um, you can't hide those type of things um, because you know you're, you're trying to qualify over here, but you're shooting yourself in the foot with your spouse or with your separation agreement. So, you know, the best thing to do is just be honest. There's different scenarios. Uh, we have we have a saying in our industry: there's no two um, cases the same. Uh, so everything has its own customized route on proceeding forward uh, to get them the financing. you have you know for people who you know they've been married they're getting a divorce and you know the reality is it's easier for a, a couple you know two income couple to qualify for financing than you know somebody potentially on their own now is a single person or a, a single parent um you know so if i have you know if there's listeners out there who are you know looking at getting financing to buy a place of their own you know, what advice do you have for them, um, you know, to maybe reassure them that they'll be able to, or, you know, what are, what are just some things that they need to be aware of to understand their new situation and whether they'll qualify or not? Well, um, you know, we've seen both sides, obviously. Sometimes it works in the spouse's uh, favor. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, I'll tell you a story of, I had a client that I just recently, uh, helped out with, um, you know, we, we did a short time 
financing bridge. She was able to buy out her spouse and then sell her home um, right after. And she made basically the profit instead of selling it with her spouse, she was able to sell it on her own and be able to double end it, um, make, you know, what she would make and what the spouse would make. Now she, she had bought out the spouse. He was no longer on the books and she was able to sell it and make more money. So we, we came up with a short term uh, bridge financing for that. Um, I think the best thing to do is be open to different scenarios and different ideas. Um, my experience is not just being a uh, mortgage broker, but I'm also, you know, a real estate investor. So kind of having an understandable an understanding about real estate and where it's going, um, just being open to different ideas on how the best case scenario is for you. And in that situation I, I shared with you, I, that client really benefited by it, by, you know, profiting an extra hundred thousand dollars from just, you know, kind of being creative. How do people decide what sort of mortgage will work best for them? You know, they're, there are longer term, shorter terms, fixed rates, variable rates. Um, often, I'm not trying to be sexist, but women have less financial savvy and knowledge than men. Do you um, work with people to bring them, you know, educate them and help I'm, them make their decision? That's a that's a great question. Um, I'm glad you asked that because you're right. Uh, so, I find sometimes it's like one or the other in the, in the uh, relationship has less knowledge or is not very educated on, you know, the financing structures and, and the way it's done. And um, as a mortgage agent, that's what we do. Our job is to educate you, to guide you, to give you the best case scenario, to give you options and, and to weigh out the pros and cons of all the options. Uh, where sometimes if you're just going to your, your traditional brick and mortar bank, you know, their job is to just get you qualified and that's it. Um, they're not looking at the whole picture. Um, as an agent as well, we, we have access to 30 different lenders. So we can shop rates, we can find the best uh, product. Uh, and, the, and that's one thing that people get caught up on. It's, it's they think it's just all about rate, but it's about the right product for you uh, in your needs. Uh, whether you're doing a short term, you know, if you're going to a bank, they're not going to ask you, but are you is this a short-term bridge for you? Are you there for one year, two years, three years? Are you there for the whole five years? You know, those are questions and things where I can kind of guide you in the right direction. So you're not um, penalized uh, on the short-term because of that. I've seen people go into mortgages, you know, five-year fix, knowing they're only going to be at this location for two years, end up breaking the mortgage early and then paying a huge penalty. When the case like that, you would put your client into a variable, not a fixed. So again, um, working with an agent, uh, we're a little bit more uh, customer service base. And so we're providing you with the education and inform information. And I think that's so important for our viewers. I think, you know, traditionally people did go to the bank, you know, the Bank of Montreal, the CIBC or whoever, but there's, you know, because they felt safe, it's a bank, a bank is going to take care of me. You know, a bank's not going to go bankrupt. It's not going to be a fly by night. So I think there's that safety if you're a very conservative person. But what people don't know is that person at the bank trying to get you, do you need any other services? Do you need a mortgage? They're getting, you know, some financial incentive to sell you this product that's sale in itself. And like you, there are excellent mortgage brokers that are really going to go into the trenches and do that work and find those rates and find those terms of excellent lenders that are not going anywhere, that they're not fly by night, that are going to save you a lot of money because um, at the end, we all want to save money. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's great that you're speaking to our viewers about this today. You no know, touching base again. When you go to the bank, that's it's just the one product, right? You're in that box, and if you don't fall in that box, you know, <laughs> too bad for you, right? So, where we have the option to look at, you know, thirty different boxes, and um, you know, I work for my client; they're my client. You know, the bank isn't my client. You know, we work with traditional banks, some of the, you know, one of three of the big five. So, all the financial institutions that we work with are all banks. They're all, you know, um, 
they're all basically all lenders that are uh, there to provide financing. So they're not small Mickey Mouse, you know, little uh, flyby um, banks that, you know, they're traditional banks. They, they just don't have the brick and mortar. So, you know, again, we're able to provide you with many solutions as opposed to going to a bank and you're only in that one little box and that's it. So. Sometimes based on people's incomes, they're only going to qualify up to a certain amount for a mortgage. But there are also second mortgages that people get occasionally. Do you help with that? Yes, we do that as well. Um, again, any type of financing solution, uh, we do all of it. So whether it be a first position mortgage or a second position mortgage, whether it be a, a home equity line of credit, um, we do all that. We also have access to not just your traditional A lending, which is, um, you know, your typical easy mortgage. We also have access to B lending, which is something where if, if the numbers are a little bit more um, risque, uh, we are able to go onto the B side and, uh, and, and provide lending there as well. Or sometimes, you know, there's private lending, which is a short term bridge just to get you out of a situation and, and then put you back into a an A mortgage. So uh, again, going back and speaking to a, about a client, you know, we put her into a private mortgage for three months and, uh, and then she was able to buy out her spouse and then, you know, buy out her home and she made, you know, more money. So yes. Do you want to be in a private mortgage for long-term? No, they're not designed for long-term. They're designed for short-term bridges, but it worked in her favor. So again, going back to being creative, um, as a broker, we can do that because we have access to A, B, and C. One of the things I've always found like interesting that I, again, I see clients uh, run into this situation is it seems like so to qualify for mortgages, it's very income based, right? And and so if somebody has like they have a home that's say mm -hmm. worth two million or three million dollars, but they have no income or very you know low income. Um, and they want to get a mortgage, um, or you know, maybe the three million home is a, is a bit high. But you know, they have a million dollars in a home, and they want to get a mortgage, um, but they they have no income. Uh, it can be challenging, um, from what I've seen. And there, we do have there are the home equity. Um, I guess is it the HELOC? I think it's called or home home equity line of credit or what. But it's my understanding is that they cracked down a little bit more on those um, in recent years, and so it's harder to get financing um, just based on your asset or your net worth. I don't know if that's correct. Someone told me that, um, but can you explain a little bit about that to listeners? Absolutely. Um, you know, people get caught up in in equity in their home, and uh, if you've had a home for a very long time, obviously the real estate market is been amazing uh you know the capital appreciation in, in real estate has been fantastic in the last 25 years and people think they can just go to the bank and say well i've got a ton of equity you know let me let me get a heloc a home equity line of credit but it still comes down to your income um you know they want to banks just don't give money away they want to know that you are able to service that debt so if you have a mortgage in the first position or and you put another mortgage in the second position, they just want to know that you're able to make those payments, the minimum payments on those. And that comes to serve that basically is servicing debt. Um, and again, income comes into play. So it's not just equity based, it's also income based. This makes a lot of sense because in divorce, somebody says, you know, I got the house and somebody you know, signed a final release that I'm not paying spousal because I gave you the house. But at the end of the day, that brick and mortar, that house is not going to put food on somebody's table. Yeah. So it makes sense that the bank would want, well, how are you going to pay for the money that you're borrowing? Yes. The brick and, and mortar again, is not going to do it. Solutions, there's always a solution. Um, you know, if you have to go into something like, a, you know, private lending in behind a second position, you can do that. Uh, again, those are usually short-term uh, solutions, but there is, if there's a will, there's a way. Good to know. Yeah, I would think that um, your background with the sal the hair salon, it probably gives you, because I, I always think hairdressers and hairstylists are quasi-therapists 
um, coaches, confidants. You know, yeah, confidants, all those things. So I would think your background there probably gives you a really good understanding of people and human psychology that you're able to bring to all your, your investment business, real estate investing and the mortgage business. Yeah. And the funny you say that I was just on the phone uh, this morning with a client who's getting divorced. And uh, I felt like I was her therapist this morning as not, not just her mortgage uh, broker. So, yeah, I mean, it's just having that understanding, you know, I think my years in, in the hair industry, it's no different, you know, hearing the divorce stories as a hairdresser, it's no different than hearing them as a mortgage agent or a mortgage broker. Um, it's just being there for them, being understanding. Um, it's a sensitive time for everybody. And, um, you know, add on COVID on top of that, you know, makes it even tougher. So yeah, I mean, it, just guiding people and, uh, and having that um, personal touch or that personal uh, relationship with them and being understanding. Listening and empathizing. Empathizing, yes. How has COVID affected things? Um, well, the real estate market has really exploded, basically in the last little while uh, what's happened we've seen a lot of um, people overbidding for for homes and um, what happens is the appraisals aren't coming in at the, the amount that they paid and um, so there's a shortfall there and mortgage companies will not give you more than what the appraisal comes in at so we've had people you know have issues with um you know, the, the, um, the financing, they'd have to come up with a shortfall, basically. Um, that's been one issue lately with the whole um, financing part of, of uh, you know, multiple bids and people over, way overpaying for property. Yeah, I've like I've heard of that happening as well. People don't, you know, they get caught up in the emotion. And then meanwhile, when they go to get financing, they've got a problem because the, the house or the property is probably not worth what they paid. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, perhaps you could explain to listeners, because I find this is, again, another issue that comes up a lot because couples are fighting over the value of the matrimonial home. And, you know, one person wants to get an appraisal. One person wants to get a letter of opinion from a real estate agent. Um, one person will say, well, the bank just appraised our property at blah, blah, blah. Can you explain to listeners the difference between like who you might get an appraisal from or what the purpose of the appraisal is? Um, and then versus a letter of opinion from a real estate agent. The, to get a fair market value, I think a real estate agent, and uh, you know, I would always suggest to use two or three and get a, an average. Um, when you're talking or getting an appraisal from an appraiser, uh, they tend to under appraise just because they need to be conservative um, when they're doing that. Because usually appraisers are doing it for a lender. So they need to be very conservative. But a, a real estate agent will, will have a better idea of what the market demands. So again, maybe having three opinions, do an average of, um, yeah, and do that. And I think that's the best way to figure out uh, what that property is worth. Yeah, I always find the one who wants to be bought out wants the letter of opinion from the real estate agent and the one who's buying wants to get an appraisal. Um, and it's always a fight about those. To me, it should be settled that, you know, it, you, mar like if you're buying somebody out, market value is what should rule the day, not, you know, what, not appraised value. If you if you own the asset jointly, it should be market value, but they're but still when arguing about it. people are getting divorced... They want to hold on to as much money as they can. So if I had to pay you for the house, I want to pay low. Well, for sure. But it, it, to me, it just should be understood. It should be market value. Um, and But it's still something that goes on that people fight about. And one of the things, too, that people forget is you should always, when you come up with that price, is always factor in the real estate agent fees, right? So if you're buying a spouse out, you know, if it's a 5% real estate agent fee, you need to minus out two and a half percent, you know, uh, saying, well, you know, if we were to sell it, when I do sell it down the road, there's going to be a factor that I need to pay, pay out an agent. So we need to minus that off the, you know, the, the top. Exactly. 
to do that in the equalization of the family property. Yeah. Remember, this $600,000 sale, this is what you're actually going to end up with out of it. Yeah, no, exactly. It would be real so, estate agent fees or, um, or even legals. Yeah. So how can listeners find you, Reno, if uh, they're interested in working with you, um, both uh, on their hair and as a, as a, uh, with respect to a mortgage? <laughs> well, right now with hair, it'd be, uh, it'd be illegal to do your hair right now. So I don't know if I can provide you with that information. But uh, if you want to contact me, um, my website is www.mortgageadvicepro.ca. Um, you can email me. You can, you'll have my, my phone number there. You can call me. I find a phone call is always best. Um, and I'm always open to, you know, providing any information or guidance to anyone. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you provided some really helpful information and we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you to our listeners uh, for tuning in to another episode of The Dish on Divorce. I'm Leanne Townsend. And I'm Jennifer Barkin. And we'll see you next time.